on time and give you all your evening after this. Um, thank you all so much for being here and for your patience with the kind of weird um, logistics of <laughs> getting everybody into the room. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you being here on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. This is the last of our spring series of Living Future Saturdays, and I'm really excited about this event today. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem. I like to usually do that, begin with reading something. Um, I recently have read this collection, Habitat Threshold, by Craig Santos Perez. Um, he's a really fantastic um, poet, and I'm going to read his poem, Love in a Time of Climate Change, which is, uh, the subtitle is Recycling Pablo Neruda's uh, Sonnet 17. So if you're familiar with the Pablo Neruda sonnet, um, and you may discover that you're familiar with it once you start hearing this version, you'll recognize it. Love in a Time of Climate Change. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals conflict diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that cause war. I love you as one loves the most vulnerable species, urgently between the habitat and its loss. I love you as one loves the last seed saved within the vault, gestating the heritage of our roots. And thanks to your body, the taste that ripens from its fruit still lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when this world will end. I love you organically, without pesticides. I love you like this because we'll only survive in the nitrogen-rich compost of our embrace, so close that your emissions of carbon are mine, so close that your sea rises with my heat. So. Welcome everyone. Um, let's take a collective breath together to arrive in the present, which is something that I usually need after ushering up and down the elevators. <laughs> I want to take a moment to express my gratitude for everyone who's helped make this event possible and the efforts and synchronicities that have allowed us to be in this room together today. Thank you to Kate and da Dasan for sharing your work and wisdom with us, to American Underground for hosting, and for the small and mighty School for Living Futures team. Um, please silence your devices if you haven't already, and feel free to make this experience as comfortable um, as you can in whatever way you need for your body. Um, we're going to begin Today, okay, I can't help you with that right now, honey. I'm doing an event. <laughs> um, we're going to begin today with Kate Shapira, and it is my great pleasure to introduce her now. She's been listening to people about climate change for 10 years at the Climate Anxiety Counseling Booth and elsewhere. She lives in Providence, Rhode Island, where she teaches nonfiction writing at Brown University and is involved with local efforts toward environmental justice, climate justice, and peer mental health support. The exercises in her first work of nonfiction, Lessons from the Climate, climate Anxiety Counseling Booth, which she has here and which I believe you all have information about on your slips of paper, which is coming out in how many days, Kate? Four days, it's, a, it's officially out, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, that book offer, offer um, the exercises offer actionable steps for connecting with others, identifying and activating community abundance, matching your skills with organized climate activism, and imagining a radically more livable future in order to bring it into being. She partners with community health initiatives, museums, schools, and universities, career development offices, and community organizations to implement and adapt these exercises to further and deepen their missions and visions. In addition to lessons from the Climate Anxiety Counseling Booth, Kate is also the author of six books of poetry, and her prose has appeared in Catapult, The Rumpus, The Toast, and as a chapbook from Essay Press called Time to Be Something Other Than Human. 
um, big uh, promo um, for SA Press, who also just recently published one of my books. And it's a great, <laughs> it's a great press. Um, also, in, in general, as a side note, everybody um, order books from independent publishers directly from the publisher right now and support independent presses because if you haven't heard SPD, Small Press Distribution, which was the distributor for like hundreds of small presses just that's been around since the 60s, just closed this past week really suddenly because of lack of funding. Um, and so it left hundreds of small of independent presses without a distributor, which means that you can't get their books through bookstores, which is really terrible. So order, if you want a book, order it directly from the publisher's website. Um, Bruce, would it be like a nice thing to do um, to send like people who have presented at a retreat like a list of their sites out with your mailing list next time? Um, a list of their websites? Yeah, or, or, like, or like their publish, like how to get their books. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That is a fantastic idea. We will do that. Um, so her book with Essay Press is called, her chat book is called Time to Be Something Other Than Human, which is a great title. And she never met a tide pool she didn't like. <laughs> so <laughs> please welcome Kate Shapira. And um, Kate, I'm going to give this to you. Okay. And um, this is for the live stream and the recording. Sure so thing. It won't, uh, uh, okay. And here. One here. Right, is that doing what you needed to do? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, if I speak too fast, just do that. Um, I don't want to, I tend to speak fast and I don't want to lose anybody. Um, so as Sarah Rose said, I wrote a book um, based on starting first just what I was hearing from people um, about their anxieties around climate change, but also around the other forces that shape our lives. And um, I want to do a couple of exercises from that book together while we're here today. Um, because one of the things that I found was that people often were not satisfied with the methods that they had for dealing with what they were feeling in response to those forces. Climate, climate impacts, uh, racism, other forms of inequality and injustice, um, other forms of ecological degradation, uh, you know, the bullshit. Like, what do you, where do you put the emotions that you have in response to the bullshit? Um, so I, and then also kind of, who do you need to become to deal with the bullshit? And how can we do that together? So those were some of the questions that I went into this book with because they were the questions that people were bringing to me. Um, and the book is an attempt, not exactly to answer them, but to, give people tools for finding their own answer for them with the people that they know and live among. Um, and I wanted to start today with an exercise that's from the book um, called Drawing from the Well. Um, you'll see there's a little paper on your chairs. Does anyone need one still? And you can also share with a neighbor if you need to do that. Um, so you'll see that there are a couple of questions on it. Um, I don't want us to try to answer those questions out loud. As someone pointed out a moment ago, they are heavy questions. They are hard to answer among people, not all of whom know and trust each other. What do you need, man? Um, but I want you to, if you're able to think about them, think about them, just take, think about them for a moment, a couple of breaths in quiet, as much a quiet as, a, as is afforded to us by a six-year-old. Um, thinking about... <laughs> thinking about the disasters that have shaped your life and how you've cared for yourself and others within them. Again, if you're able, but you don't need to bring yourself back to that place to do this exercise. So let's just take a moment. You can close your eyes or keep them open. And the disasters can be any kind. All right, 
and now I'm going to talk you through this exercise, which you can do anytime for any reason at any length that you need to be reminded that you are not alone. So you're going to start just by bringing forward a memory you have of safety and connection with other people. Bring the details forward, make them clear and intense. The sounds, the sights, the textures, the tastes of that connection. If you're feeling any kind of sadness or loneliness about how that time ended or the fact that it is not now, you can also offer thanks to that time for being there for you when it was there. And I'm now going to ask you to bring forward memories of yourself in a time when you have reached safe harbor. That could be an extension of what you were just remembering, or it could be a different time. But some how you were at that time, that time of safe harbor. What did you walk like, dress like? What was the sound of your voice at that time? How did you move or sit still? Make them clear and intense, those memories. And if you've changed from being that person since that time, if there are things that you don't like about yourself at that time, you can also still thank yourself for living through that moment and coming to the moment that you're now in. And finally, any safety or any confidence that has come from bringing these memory fo memories forward, ask that to be ready for you when it's time to face another change, when it's time for things to change again. Knowing that there have been points when you have been safe, however brief, when you have been connected with others, however lightly. And that's yours, and you carry that with you. All right, let's bring those back to this place in time. That exercise comes from a friend of mine who I talked about, um, for the, I talked about stuff with for this book. Uh, she's a disaster social worker, um, and her work involves sharing with people the skills to weather emotionally um, times of strain and emergency, so that even if conditions are bad, they will not treat themselves or others poorly. They will not lead, be led into uh, selfishness, anger, unkindness uh, for very long, and they will be able to bring themselves back out of those states. Um, and one of the things that I hope to do um, together today a bit and with this book in the long term is to help people kind of identify their strength and their ability to weather what is difficult. Some of you may be intimately connected with that strength, and strength in yourselves. Um, others may be like, I don't know where I would go to find that. Um, and we can help each other with that, I think. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit uh, about kind of how I got started um, doing that, and then to maybe read a tiny bit from the book, not too, too much. Um, and then there'll be another exercise that we can do together. I'm also just going to check the time. Sorry for looking at my phone. I don't want to push us over. Um, 
servers, when will you like us to go to for my part? Oh, okay, terrific. We can do that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as Sarah Rose said, about 10 years ago, um, my uh, worry about the effect that climate change was going to have on living creatures was so severe um, that uh, I was just crying all the time. Uh, I cried at work, I cried at dinner, um, I cried on the couch. Uh, and um, I cried at my partner. Uh, I cried in front of my colleagues. Um, and no one seemed to know how to talk about it with me. Like, I would bring it up, and they would sort of be like, is something wrong with you? You know, like, this is too severe of a reaction to this thing. Like, this is too much. Like, something is wrong with you. Um, and I didn't think so, but I couldn't tell. Um, and I wanted to try to figure out a way to talk about it with people. So the partner I mentioned is a cartoonist, and we have books of uh, Charlie Brown comics all over the house, those little collections, paperback collections. And some of you may have seen or remember that one of the characters um, has a little cardboard booth that says psychiatric help five cents on it. Um, and I was like, what if I made something like that? What if I made something like that and set it up? Um, it's little, it's non-threatening. Um, Maybe that could be like a kind of weird but okay invitation for people to speak to me about this. Did they have climate anxieties, in fact? And if not, what were they worried about? What was the pressure that was on the lives of the people living in my city? So I set it up um, in the park that's opposite the big bus station in downtown Providence. Um, and um, I pretty quickly discovered that a lot of people uh, did have anxieties about climate change. Um, I also discovered a lot of the other things that people were contending with. Um, I was never going to turn anyone away. You know, I wasn't going to be like, well, your anxiety is stupid. Um, so people spoke to me about trying to get services for their kid in school. Um, people spoke to me about looking for safe housing, um, for trying to stay sober. Uh, people spoke to me about losing a parent. Um, and many people also spoke to me about their fears for life on Earth. Um, what form was it going to take? Uh, how hard was it going to be? Um, who were we going to lose? And the number one thing I would say that I would hear over and over is, what can I do? I'm only one person. What can I do? And what kind of blinked into my head was, well, you've got to be more than one person. But I didn't really know what that meant at the time. And a, another piece fell into place when somebody came up to the booth and said, hey, I saw that you were doing this, and you really are. And I was like, yes, I am really doing it. Um, and um, he was like, well, you know, I'm part of a bunch of people who are trying to stop a liquefied natural gas plant from being built um, on the south side of Providence. Um, which is a working class neighborhood inhabited by a lot of older people, a lot of people of color, um, a lot of families, um, and is also like right up against the kind of like the port of Providence, which is an, an industrial port. Like fuel is stored there, chemicals are stored there. There's a lot of scrap metal uh, there too, for some reason. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the city's sacrifice zones, right? It's like where the city drives people who it does not value. Um, and then builds industry there. And so he's, Julian, this guy, um, said, do you want to come to a meeting about that? And I said, yes, I do. Um, and so then I got a little bit more involved with the effort to fight that, um, that plant. And uh, we lost. We lost. They built it. Um, but in working with and being organized by the people from the South Side who were working to fight the plant, um, I also began getting more connected with other people who were doing environmental justice and climate justice organizing in the city. And so when people came to me and they said, I feel so alone, um, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go, I could say, well, would you, you know, here's the website of these, of these people, here's their Facebook group. 
um, people are coming out to yell at the senator about this today or yell at the governor about this today. Would you like to go? There's a potluck to raise money for this. Would you like to go? Um, and also to sort of ask them questions, hey, um, about what they were good at and what they felt they could offer um, to try to draw that understanding forward in them if they did not have it. Um, what were the opportunities for not just action in our city, climate action, but for connection and working together and collaborating? And I started to kind of build up that picture and then be able to feed it back out to people who were talking to me and didn't know it yet. <coughs> um, but the thing about the climate anxiety counseling booth is that it is not a terrific organizing tool, really, because it's just usually like a cup, me and one other person talking to one another or a couple of people talking with me, maybe. Um, and so I was, you know, I could send people places if they wanted to go, but um, it felt limited. And people also felt like, you know, I would hear a lot of like, oh, like, that sounds good, but I could never do that. I can't do that. That's beyond my means, or it's beyond my power, or it's beyond, you know, it's beyond me. Um, it would be hard for me to do that. I can't do that. Um, and so, you know, they, what they were saying to me in a way was, I cannot change. The world cannot change because I cannot change. I cannot change to meet the world how it is now. And I thought, okay, well, how, you know, how could we, how could we do that? What would, ha what would have to change for you to be able to change so that the world could change? Um, and I was like, well, people have done this. Let's find them. Um, and so I started as asking people who I knew who were involved with climate and environmental justice organizing to some degree, you know, how did you become who you are now? How did, you know, how did you go from where you were before to where you are at this moment? Um, and so that ended up being, I think, in a certain way, like the spine of this book is the conversations with those people, those teachers, um, the climate scientist, you know, lab climate scientist, climate modeler who um, became an environmental justice organizer because she walked out into the street in Miami where she was living at, to a place where like one of the projections had said there's going to be flooding here. And she saw the water start to come up out of the ground on a sunny day, out of a storm drain. Um, the person who became, you know, an, who ended up doing like quite a bit of very intense direct, uh, nonviolent direct action um, because of things that she had learned and seen um, uh, when she went out for an, in, out to South Dakota for an internship about something totally different. Um, the person who, uh, started out being like a, an intense direct action person um, and then became a kayak instructor. And then I think also maybe worked for like the university uh, like sustainability initiative at one point and now does like um, somatic and body work coaching for people who, especially for people who are fighting for environmental justice and need practice and caring for one another in this additional way. So just people who were like, who took that, you know, the moment to look around them and say, what is needed? And where does that intersect with what I can do? Um, and even like, where does that intersect with like, not just what I can do, but what's gonna like feel all right to me? Um, and, and we're able to at least for a while find that place. So their stories are in my book. Um, and then also, as my mother says, extremely annoyingly, what you practice, you get better at. And she usually says it when I'm doing something that she thinks I should stop doing. Um, but it's true. If you practice being in despair, you will get better at being in despair. If you practice being like, if you practice punching down, right? Like taking your anger out on people who can't do that much about it, you will get better at punching down. You will get better at it. It is, you don't think of it as a skill, but you will get better at it. And so I started trying to think about like, what would allow people to kind of reflect on what they wanted to get better at and then practice that thing. Um, and so that's the other piece that's in the book 
And what we just did together, those of you who were here for the, um, the first exercise, that is one of the question sets and practices that are in the book. Sometimes the questions are for people to discuss together, and we will, we're going to do one like that in just a minute. Checking the time. Yes, perfect. Um, uh, sometimes the questions are to reflect on within yourself, as we just did. Um, sometimes they're to like think about over the course of a week. And then the practices are to practice. Sometimes they're to practice, like, oh god, people call it co-regulation, but I don't like that. But like, uh, kind of like having, like being in the same place with someone and, and matching how they're being um, in a way that suits you both well. Uh, sometimes they're to practice um, planning a, dis a, a positive disruption of something that should not go forward in the place where you live. Um, sometimes they are to practice asking questions or communicating. Um, another one that's in there uh, is uh, also from my mom. Um, she sometimes in, when it was very nice and warm in like February, and people in the line at the post office would be like, oh, it's such a beautiful day. She'd be like, yeah, but you know, I hate what it means about what's happening to the world. And they would be like, oh. <laughs> and she would be like, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you bring it up? How do you have these conversations with people? How do you have them in a way that you can both tolerate, but that doesn't leave you exactly where you were at before or even more stuck in the mud? So. Opportunities to do that um, are also present in this book. And um, I'm going to read a tiny, tiny bit. And then, uh, and then um, we're going to try one. This is from a, a section called Unclenching Our Hands in the Face of Disaster. Eva Amanda Agudelo came up to the Climate Anxiety Counseling booth in May of 2018. We'd met before. She, her carpenter husband, Maddie, and their three-year-old had held a banner with me at a windy rally against a liquefied natural gas plant, previously mentioned. Maddie was with her this time, too, and their conversation was mostly with each other. I'm worried that buying a house in Rhode Island was a terrible idea because of sea level rise, she said. I checked, Maddie said. Our house is 75 to 80, 80 feet above sea level. We all know that guy, right? This raised Amanda's ire. But what about all the people who aren't 75 to 80 feet above sea level? You can't live in a world where your neighbors are flooded out and you're fine. And then am I going to have people breaking in because they're starving? We can't survive unless all of us survive. A lot of people get as far as, am I going to have people breaking in because they're starving, but never move through that fear to the next question of shared survival. We've been planting food in our yard, Amanda went on. The solution to scarcity is to offer freely, so you have to become a producer and have something to offer. I can't feed everybody, but maybe I can feed people enough to keep someone from hurting me. Well, there's still fear in that last sentence, the fear that jumps ahead to a future where other people will, of course, be the enemy. So I ask you to also notice, without judgment, how you hear it, that fear, whether and where you recognize yourself in it. Who do you think you'd be in that scenario and why? Just think about that for a second. And who do you think other people will think you are in that scenario and why? And there's some ugliness there, right? Like you know that that is a situation, even just imagining it can bring out the ugliness in people. It can bring out the desire for control, the desire to dominate, um, the desire to protect, the desire to defy, um, or the recognition that you might be targeted. And I think like identifying a bunch of Yes, no. not at all. <laughs> happy to, happy to. Let me, let me get it, hold on. Um, to build trust and power together we first need to let go of any illusion that we owe each other nothing. Thank you. You're welcome. And I can also uh, write it down for you if you would like, or you could take a picture. Okay. That you'll buy. Um, uh, that is on page 31. And if you can remember that, you're a better rememberer than I am. Um, 
let's, so I'm gonna, we're gonna, there's four clipboards, so we're gonna make four groups. Um, maybe uh, give one to you for starters. Uh, I think you all are gonna be a group. I think you all are gonna be a group, you four. Um, you scooch over here maybe, Nate, if you would, to this group, you five. One for this crew, and then one for this crew right here. Thank you. And there's pens coming. There's pens coming. Let's see. All right. So the instructions are kind of on the paper. But if you want to wave me over, wave me over, and I will come and explain in more depth. What do you want? What do you want, Nate? What do you want? No? No. All right. See if you work it out. Introduce each other and get to work. We need one scribe per group. Oh, sure. I could do that. I could even show something to the camera if that's helpful. Um, I think I just gotta like say it. Okay. And I have it. I have, of course, I had it marked. Cool. They can hear you right now. So. Okay, great. So the exercise that I'm doing right now is called declaring your abundance. Uh, as you probably know, mutual aid and sharing what you can spare, identifying what you can spare, uh, people to people is the antidote to hoarding. So what you locate through this exercise can build a place that can accommodate anyone, whether they're passing through or have come to stay. And I've asked these groups of people to all answer versions of these questions together and to pool their knowledge of the place where they live. So the questions are, what administrative systems do you wrestle with regularly and successfully? Insurance, immigration, unemployment. What materials are easy for you to get a hold of? construction materials, garden tools, repair uh, materials also, I guess. What habits and practices of caring for others are familiar and even fun for you? That could be elder care, child care, tending plants or pets, cooking for people. And then I added a couple. Oh, no, wait, I got more that were in there. Uh, what are you good at building, fixing, maintaining, or taking apart? Cars, boats, bikes, buildings, blenders. Are you good at showing other people how to do something? Are you good at coordinating a bunch of people to do something together? Or at solving problems or resolving conflicts? And then which of these things are you not good at or comfortable with, but you know someone who is, and you can pull those people in from your network? And I added a couple. I asked if there are places in the city where food could grow. I also asked, uh, you need something? I got a question here, one moment. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, what is the very first thing we should be doing? So the very first thing that you should be doing is just asking, like, you know, pick one of these and ask if, one of these, one of these, and then ask, like, is anybody good at getting hold of these materials? Is there anybody here could, who could get hold of garden tools or materials, building materials, pretty easily um, without, you know, breaking the bank. Um, and then the law. Uh, the law, you may break the law. <laughs> ah, so we, we go to each of these little yep. pods. And exactly. Like who, who, who can do pod. it? Okay. Yep, exactly. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The very first So uh, I hope you heard that you on the tape. Um, that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out where in the city these elements reside. And I might go to, from group to group and just spy on them and see if they could, they might well pick anything up. I'm just spying. He's just saying, yes, strip along LED. Right here. Also, Dave's farm. Like, <coughs> and, um, yeah, the, 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 I think I know actually 
That's great. We were like, yeah. cool. Can I, <laughs> totally. can I, can I help it out? Please. Um, where, what's a really, what's one where you're like, ooh. Like what? Like stuck. Oh, we haven't gone to all of them yet. Okay. This one seems challenging. Building, fixing, maintaining, or taking apart. Oh, uh-huh. Anybody good at building, fixing, maintaining, or taking apart stuff? Brandon's really good at fixing and maintaining. What kinds of things? Um, really anything. I mean, he's a carpenter. He can figure out electric, like a uh, electrician thing. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Put that down. <laughs> Anybody else know contractors or? Uh, I know contractors. What about habitat people? Delegation. Yeah, I was saying how to fixing things and I for me this is kind of a roundabout way but I, I will explain it. So I so I'm an immigrant and when I was living in Southern Africa the, the whole American dream thing was, you know, go to college, get a good education, get a good job, you have this like okay, it doesn't work out that way. And it doesn't work out that way. And I feel like the place we are now economically it's really hard to live here and so it's really hard to build that right now. And so I feel like there's there's so many things in the community and just around the country that are broken, sitting there, unhabitable, things like that. And if people could just go in, and my mom actually does this. She, she'll buy houses for really cheap and she'll fix them up and then rent them to like Section 8. Mm -hmm. you know, so she's got contractors and things like that. And so that's something that, you know, I feel like if the right resources of people pull together, we could, you know, help people get, get I mean, I'm not saying create the American dream for everybody, but get people closer to that. Instead of building new, 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 right? What are we already mm -hmm. doing? Mm -hmm. Refresh a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right, like could you take the substance of two houses that are uninhabitable, yeah. make them into one, and then whatever salvageable from from them combine, and then make that available, as you said, to someone who maybe couldn't get a home any other way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the American dream is a fallacy that way. It is. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is like, how much of this, how much of this do we actually need in order to live well? Like of the things that people believe that they need in order to live well, which do you really, 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 really need? Which maybe nobody should have. And then which are some things where it's like, it's nice if it fits the conditions, but it's not required. And maybe there's something else that could fill that void for you. That might be a good thing to think about too, is like what could fill, who here feels like they, they could like, how do I even ask this question? This is a new question for me, so I'm just thinking about it. But like, I think a lot of time when people embrace the American dream like whole hog and in a way that is hurtful um, or is dependent on other people suffering, um, which like historically, yes, um, they're trying to they're trying to fill something. So how else could they fill that? What else could give them purpose, pleasure beyond security? but like reasons for being and living and striving that are not just like, oh, I want to have a house that looks like this. Maybe chew on that question a little bit as a group. I chew on that question all the time. You can take the lead. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
One more minute, my friends. One more minute. Say your last things and make your last notes. All right, I'm going to call you all back to the center. Can I call you back to the center, please? We're almost done here with my time, uh, my part of the time, but um, two things. Uh, one is, could I hear maybe from like two, three people about something that was like a pleasant surprise in this conversation? And that could be like, oh, this person knows a lot about such and such. Or it could be like, oh, like such a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. One more? Pleasant surprise? Those are two good ones. It seems like Brandon from Save the Fall. He's on our list. Uh-oh. I'm Roxy. I'm intrigued. One more. At the digits, because this was playful, but it isn't just play. It is for real, and I believe that we can do it. So um, I'm going to also ask one last thing of you all, which is to help move the chairs back into some rows, because um, Dasan is going to have some slides for you. Thank you so, so much for doing this with me. At the end, at the end? Write them down, though, so you don't forget them. I, I should have known. Here's for you. I will you know I have to leave at 10 Right now, over here, you just It's okay. I believe it. You, I, I just like to assume that normally that's what happens, is that someone has to go.
Okay, everybody, we're going to get started again. Um, I am now honored to introduce our second guest for this afternoon. Christopher Massenberg, better known as Dasan Ahanu, is a public speaker, organizer, curator, educator, poet, spoken word artist, songwriter, MC, and loyal hip hop head, born and raised in Raleigh, North Carolina. He is the co-founder and managing director of Black Poetry Theater, a Durham-based theater company that creates and produces original poetry and spoken word-based productions. As an active participant in Poetry Slams, Dasan has competed regionally and nationally as a founding member and coach of Durham, North Carolina's own Bull City Slam team. In 2010 and 2014, Ahanu led the Bull City Slam team in winning the Southern Fried Southeastern Regional Poetry oh, Slam, gracious, the largest regional poetry slam in the country. <laughs> he is also, I know, he, <laughs> he also led the team to a third place finish at the 2010 National Poetry Slam and a second place finish in the Group Peace Finals in the 2012 National Poetry Slam. Ignore all that. Um, he also all that stuff. serves as the cultural organizing director for North Carolina Climate Justice Collective, which is an amazing organization, which we're representing here. Um, welcome, Dasan. Thank you. Oh, man. I hate bios. Oh, my God. It's like, really? All of that? Okay. You have to stop being so impressive. Uh, um, but it is relevant because all that happened because of community. And so um, all of those experiences led me um, to here because I had kind of a unique thing of when I first walked into an open mic a long time ago, it's been 25 years now, more. Um, I also at the time got involved in social justice work. Um, there were elder freedom fighters and organizers, especially in Raleigh, um, primarily um, Black Workers for Justice and other coalitions um, who were looking for young folks to get engaged. And so my journey artistically was parallel to being involved in community organizing um, and social justice work. So my framework for navigating my way through, especially being an artist in North Carolina, where it's not California, it's not New York, it's not, um, was about how to think about my place in community and the community has taken care of me. It's how I ended up in Durham. I came to Durham in 2004 and Durham just kind of adopted me and said, okay, you're ours now. Um, and, and Raleigh has been, actually, I don't know how Raleigh feels. At first, Raleigh was acting a little jealous. I don't know. I think Raleigh just gave in at this point. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. What we're going to talk about today is a small portion of some work that I did. Uh, the Art of Descent is a five-week course that I did at North Star Church of the Arts um, in collaboration with uh, Carolina Performing Arts. It was uh, uh, under the context of arts and public service, but because I am who I am, I let them, I taught them to let me do an arts and public service course. I was in charge, I was the program director for the grant that this was under. We had previously done this on campus, and of course when you do these things on campus, you gotta, we took some really, some of the professors who taught the course on campus did some really amazing things with it, but they let me take it into the community, and of course, you know, we radicalized it a little bit. So, um, but it was a framework that started for me working with the Center for Community Change in 2014 as a writing fellow and looking at some of the work they were doing. At that point in time, it was policy work. They were looking at poverty. Uh, well, they're a policy organization, but at that point in time, they were looking at poverty, and particularly families. Um, working class folks, uh, some of the challenges um, in being able to navigate, maintain, and sustain families in this country given all, the, given all the constraints. And a lot of what they were talking about and a lot of what they were giving to their field organizers um, resonated with me, but not because I was involved in social justice work, it was because I was an artist. And that sent off this light bulb moment that kind of was a culmination of years of my experiences and I came back to the community to talk to creatives. In doing so, we all sort of agreed there is a disconnect and it led me on this journey. So, 
today um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about um, art and um, change, right? Which sort of kind of led me to my position with the Climate Justice Collective. I've been working with them since they started the Climate Justice Summit, and my role, which is a new role for them, is um, an intersection of my work and the way that they work. And so I want to talk about that a little bit so that we can think about where we all fit in this um, as folks who are looking for change and looking to push change, and then all of the artists and creative and beautiful people in the room. But I want to start first by playing, there's an amazing album called This Is Our Environment by Joseph Herbst, H-E-R-B-S-T. Um, an amazing young musician that I was introduced to by an artist named Rashad Ease, who is a hip hop artist and MC who's also a forester. Um, and he was at the time um, faculty at uh, North Carolina State School of Forestry and got involved in this project. Joseph wanted a dedicated a full jazz project to talking about the environment and talking about environmental and climate justice. So my contribution is this piece. And that is not me. There we go. Mama said she knew by the time the street lights came on, she did it. Mama said clean up your room, she did it. Mama said go outside and play, she did it. You can't stay out of grown folks' business. You got quiet when you get a grown man. This is called Mother Nature. And so, um, so there's a premise that this is all based on, and, and, and that piece is just an extension. Um, one, it was just to be in community with a group of artists um, committed to lifting and delivering a particular message, and all of us um, seeking to take the things that we learned from our relationship with organizers and with organizations of folks who are on the front line of this work and being able to translate that into something we could spread. And that's at the heart of what I believe this connection is. 
And it's based on a, a premise, a framework that I operate with that I call radical voice. Um, of course, radicalism is the idea of going to the root or origin uh, of an issue, the fundamental um, idea of favoring drastic political, economic, or social reforms, forming a basis or foundation, existing inherently in a thing or person. And then the other piece is voice, something likened to speech. The likened to speech is the part that's important um, as conveying impressions to the mind, expression in spoken or written words are by other means a distinctive manner of expression. That's art, right? So when I talk about voice, I am talking about art as an extension of all of our voices, because that's what art is. Um, it is a reflection of all of us. Um, and that's what artists hope to do, is to reflect all of us. Um, it's a difficult thing when there's art we don't particularly approve of, or we think that we, we look at and see as it delivering messages that aren't in our best interest. But what we are looking at is we're still looking at us, <laughs> which is why it's so difficult to deal with. We may not be looking at our particular community, but it is reflecting an us that needs to be addressed. Um, so we talk about voice. We're talking about voice, radical voice, throughout voice being used in a radical way with the understanding that like every major social movement in recent history has been chronicled in art and culture. There's always art in conjunction. There's no way for artists to sit, see things happening to people and art not come. And we continue, and this is globally, right? We are watching folks turn to art as a manner of expression, but also turning to art as a way of being able to make sure the message being delivered resonates past their house, their block, um, especially in the advent of social media. Now what we have is we have folks putting art on social media with the expectation that it will get shared so that the message spreads. And we've seen this for global conflicts. Um, so much so that it has been outlawed, people have been arrested or under attack for even turning to the art and delivering it because they know if it makes it over here, we're going to respond to it. Um, we can't escape it, it's something we're very used to. Um, but the one thing about this though um, is also how art and the way that art and creatives organize how similar it is to social movements when social movements have been the most powerful vehicle for change in modern history. It moved from political movements to social movements. Well, the beautiful thing about social movements is they mirror artistic movements in so many ways, both in terms of the way that they're talked about, but also the language and rhetoric of social movements is exactly the way artistic movements are, right? Even today, the way they organize all of it, very, very similar. But the premise of this is much like my position, which is what has typically happened is that, and it's not a bad thing, but an artist creates, folks who adorn the work see the art, and the art gets lifted up as being an inspiration for folks to keep doing the work. What you may then have is you may have culture war workers being invited to come celebrate wins. So they are either inspiration or motivation or an accent. But the artist is still over here. You may have an artist who is inspired to create because they came over to help do work. They volunteered, they were on the front lines for a demonstration, they leafed, they, you know, they, they, they stood, they, um, st they stood in the gap, they, did, they helped volunteer for childcare, right? And then they go back over here to create. What the thing that I have been advocating for for the last nine years is that these folks should be involved in all of the organizing and strategy for the work. The reciprocal relationship created is so powerful because what happens is, is we, all, we are over here as organizers and as folks on the front lines talking about political education, that artists have to get secondhand, right? And generally what happens is, is they're getting it as they get hold of the information that chronicles the work that has already been done. Wouldn't it be amazing if they were with us while it was happening? Because inherently what it's going to do is going to inform the art that gets created, which can then get lifted up as a, as a model, but also as, a, as, a, as an outpouring of the movement, um, while also helping to enhance the language and the communication of the movement. So it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing um, that cycles. The other thing about it is, is that uh, is that it, it also unlocks a very special power. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, 
But first, I want to model this, just, just so we can just, you know, because I'm one of those, I always tell my students, like, I can say anything, but let's, let's, let's test it out. So let's play with a thing really quick called the haiku. Now, the haiku, American haiku. You know, we, we've come to understand this over the years. We've been taught three-line poem, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, a 17-syllable poem. Um, and typically it implies simplicity, intensity, and directness of expression. It's a Japanese art form. Initially, we've, we're working with a form that has been developed out of translation. Um, you know, original Japanese haiku, waka, tanka, they, 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 they take a lot of forms um, and that don't typically fall in our understanding of syllable and line count. Um, but for the sake of today, right, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about American haiku. And what I would like for each of you to do is to take a moment. Now, what's over here are things called abstractions. This is one of the other powers of art that I love. These are things that we all understand, but our definition of them are based on our own experiences. It's one of those beautiful things that I love because so often um, these are universal while also being very disparate, right? So we can be ta both be talking about it while having very different conversations. Um, our understanding of them can also continue to grow so that the way we define them can change over time. This is an example of what it means um, when we talk about moving, building, standing together. The impact that it can have is because our understanding of these will grow because of our collective involvement with each other. Um, they're also, um, but uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment, I want you to pick one, and I want you to write a haiku that is an example of one of these abstractions in action. Okay? I'll say that one more time. Pick one, I want you to write a haiku, 17 syllables, that haiku is an example of one of these abstractions in action. So pick one, picture a scene of it, and then I want you to write a quick haiku about it. I'll give you a couple minutes. Five, seven, five, and feel free. Everybody does it. Use your fingers if you have to. You know? <laughs> it's totally fine. Nobody will judge you. I promise we all, we all, all got to count our way through it. see all the wheels turning. Makes me happy. I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah, that's it. Count your way through it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, see it. So I'll give you another 15, 20 seconds, and then what I'm going to need is I'm going to need I'm going to need five folks to say their haiku. That's all. I just need five. Just five. So. <clears throat> All right. 
So, <clears throat> any five, don't all volunteer at once. Yes, I have one, okay, I have two, can we get three more? Three, four, okay, five, beautiful. <clears throat> you can start, give us a start. Please do. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Um, mine's about five lines. Mm -hmm. Rail down the Bay Creek, 100 miles from the coast, all in with the sea. Nice, 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 nice. All right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Keep an open mind, even when John walks the horse, don't let him use it. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. AirPods and pockets, the world is back in color. My attention here. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Uh, I apologize. I misunderstood the direction. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> Whatever your haiku's about. <laughs> what <was> nothing. <laughs> True fun, kindness, beauty. Purpose brings beauty each day. Faith in freedom is key. Yes. It's fine. Beautiful. So now the wonderful thing about this is, is that in individually, each one of these pieces are amazing. But when we talk about an integrated strategy for change as part of this idea of the art of descent, is that think about the possibilities when we can do this. Because each one of these, can, each one of these haiku can become the basis for, for sending a very necessary message out into the world. This, but there's also some other things that can happen because collectively, all of these haiku can send a larger message about what we want to be able to have happen for people, right? The, all of these haiku can become the basis for being able to be a campaign of messaging that gets delivered. Each one of these, each one of these haiku could, could become the, the, the central theme for a study group. And, and a gathering of folks in order to be able to build, connect, learn, and respond to, right? Um, each one of these could become the basis for a t-shirt that could get sold in order to raise funds for, raise funds to support the movement. Each one of these haiku could, could be the source of an exhibit where um, communities, especially disparaged and, and, and damaged communities, let's think about communities in Eastern North Carolina along the coast are actually given each one of these haiku in order to respond to in terms of photographs and that, that each category of photographs is defined by each haiku, right? The possibilities just from each of these individual moments is endless, but that only happens through collective action because it takes artists, creatives, organizers, and frontline workers together in a room to be able to imagine and see that these haiku could have six, seven lives. Otherwise, what they become is they become haiku that may get read at the beginning of a meeting because someone happened to read the book that has these haiku in it. Or maybe they get put in the corner of a flyer as an inspirational quote for an action that's taking place, right? They continue to be an accent while the writers of the haiku continue to be supportive and encouraged, but not involved. Right? Right? Even maybe in the audience or hand in hand at the action, but was never in the room when it was decided how this would all happen, and aren't in the room after the action, even though they've been inspired by everybody's energy to do the work. Right? Personally may make change in their life and continue to write more haiku that may end up in a book that gets read but never involved or a part of the organization that's doing the work. I think we can't keep doing that. Right? I think it's a disservice because we're also talking about communities that are continuing to produce more artists who are producing art out of the circumstances that we're fighting but aren't, aren't directly connected to the movement but have influence. And we're at a point where we have to start to consider that, if, that whoever we aren't engaging, we have the possibility of losing. 
because they're going to get engaged by an institution or a system somehow. And what are those? Is it a larger industry? Is it, is, it, is it an academic institution? Is it a creative marketing agency? Somehow they're going to get engaged. And where is that brilliance going to be mined? And which way is it going to be directed? So in that, it's a couple of things. Um, we understand, and I won't spend too much time here because we know what art can do, right? We know that how powerful art is, and we've seen a number of examples. We know that there's a powerful possibility. What I want to get into really quick before my time is up is three things. The first of these quotes, mm, this is where I get excited. I've got, I've got three quotes in here plus, a, plus an anecdote that just, right, that just really, really get me. The first is this first one. We call upon all honest intellectuals, all honest writers and artists to abandon decisively the treacherous illusion that art can exist for art's sake or that the artist can remain remote from the historic conflicts in which all men, all of us, patriarchy, must take sides. We call upon them to break with bourgeois ideas which seek to conceal the violence and fraud, the corruption and decay of capitalist society. Um, this is even more important when we talk about, the, we talk about environmental issues or environmental justice because of the individualism that gets promoted so often as a solution, which we know is not the adequate solution, right? It takes collective care, it takes a radical vision of change, we have to seek new methods, um, and we have to kind of move from some of these individualistic things that kind of put pressure on all of us individually to change our habits as, if, you know, as a method of changing things, but also shames particular communities who do not have the privilege or benefit or resources to make some of the changes or take advantage of some of the things that are being presented to us as alternatives. Um, um, so we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta really get out of that thing. Um, then the other one is true art, which is not content to play variations on ready-made models, but rather insists on expressing the inner needs of man and mankind in its time. True art is unable to not be revolutionary, not to aspire to a complete and radical reconstruction of society. That it must do, were it, not, were it only to deliver intellectual creation from the chains which bind it, and to allow all mankind to raise itself to those heights which only isolated geniuses have achieved in the past. Like the Climate Justice Collective and so many other organizations, it is that idea of complete and radical reconstruction of society that has been taken up. That if we're going to really affect, and we are thinking about climate and environmental justice, it is a radical reconstruction. Uh, you know, it, we're not going to get there with, 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 with short, short-sighted solutions. We have to kind of get to a place where we can start to radically change. Here's the thing, in order to do so, what we have to be reminded of, and this is the thing, power, thing about social movements, is that we have to be reminded of what it will look like when we win so that we are continually understanding of where we're going. And that is the power of art, right? The, the, the thing about a movement is that you have to articulate the source of the issue and you have to direct that energy towards a target. And you have to do that until you have actually brought about change. Anytime that gets disrupted, the movement gets disrupted. Because all of that, all of that effort, all of that energy, um, it's taxing. And without being reminded of what you're going to do and being reminded that there is something possible and you will win, then you lose folks, right? The other side of this can give you alternatives that seem like safer, more comfortable, like, and also it is hard for folks to be on the front line of change, right? But it's also hard to find people to replace them if we're not able to continually help people understand why it's necessary. Um, we have a vehicle at our disposal that can continue to remind us of what this is all about, and that is art. Um, which leads us to this next thing about, when I talk about the manufacture of the scent. Um, so, Stephen Duncan, co-founder of the Center for Artistic Activism with Stephen Lambert, has this piece called Dreams. You can find the PDF online. Um, they make it available. Um, about the manufacture of the scent. And he says, Unless progressives acknowledge and accept a politics of imagination, desire, and spectacle, and most important, make it ethical and make it our own, we will bring about our own ruin rather than preservation. And here's the reason why. So in it, Ron Suskin, who was a writer I had, I had heard about, um, a, uh, a popular writer, was working on a piece for the New York Times. This is the 
the, the GW Bush administration, Daddy Bush. And um, he recounted the conversation between him and an unnamed senior advisor to the president. Listen to this, listen to this, y'all. I just want y'all to listen to this passage. Here we go. All right, and then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this thing up. Okay. The aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something, Ron, this is Susskind, I nodded and murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism, he cut me off. It's not the way the world really works anymore. He continued, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's just how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. Yeah. Yeah. He said, we're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. So... There's this quote by James Baldwin that talks about like what the artist is, but here's the reason why that's so powerful, and this is the, quote, the way I'll close, is the belief that we are the world's actors, that we shape reality. So you can study something, we'll just, like the, 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 the pretentiousness, the, it, the, the, just the privilege, the, like the arrogance right, of it all. But here's the thing. If over here are people who believe they're the world's actors and that they can shape reality and they can shape it however they want, to combat that, the first thing that comes in my mind is that there is a body of folks over here who also spend their whole careers in craft looking to operate outside of the literal, right? They're, they're encouraged to stretch their imagination, to think outside the box, to picture, to dream. They're literally taught to create reality, right? To make meaning out of nothing, to make things make sense, to make connections, to not use that body of brilliance when on the other side, there is a group of folks who are recklessly going about acting in the world. Does it make any sense? It is to leave one of our most powerful weapons at home against folks who are wielding a whole other kind of weapon with no regard. And so in that, that's the power of this. Um, there's a, and for, for a really beautiful example, I want you to just note this name, Nicholas Smith. Um, he started this kind of, this series um, of art. Since then, he has gone on to be a really, really, uh, just, he's done so much work as an illustrator. Um, but it's an example. The thing that, a reason why I'm showing you, Nicholas, um, was that he says, my experiences have shown me that there's a natural link between art and activism. With activism, there's so many problems and issues in the world. Sometimes you wish you could just grab everybody and direct them towards a solution. Putting those issues isn't, isn't in the words isn't that easy for me, but art innately has the ability to move people to shout out, this is wrong, this needs to be fixed in a matter of seconds. So I wanna make sure we leave time, of course there's questions and things like that, but thank you. So I want you to just think about how we can both not just use art, not just use cultural, but how can we think about the place for artists and cultural workers within the work that we're trying to do, young and old. Thank you. Wonderful. So now we have a few minutes for some questions and conversation. So I'm going to pull two chairs <laughs> forward for Deshaun and Kate. I know you guys have been holding, holding tight and remembering your questions and comments. So, oh, excuse me. Um, So this is questions, but also it can be comments. It can be what resonated for you. It can be um, what threads did you maybe see connecting the two presentations. 
It might be thoughts about how we could think, feel, or act differently as a result of what we did and heard um, today. So anything you want to say or anything you want to ask to either both presenters or individually is fair game. And I'll give this one. Do you want to start that one? Do you yeah. have something to offer for that one? Um, uh, uh, that's a great question. And it's one we have to continue to raise because we are, we haven't been good with it. Um, part of my journey was looking for how I could show up with all the things that I am and all the things that I'm, I'm working with and not having a model. Um, I, was in a, I was at one point in time by, in a room where they told me to apprentice myself. Like that was those the exact words. Um, and, and so it, it, it's a thing because within movement work, we, we, we talk about you know, healing and care and accountability and being able to challenge and check. And we, we take great care to think about how to remove obstacles for people participating. But um, we have studies, we do all these things, but when I hear your question, it's not about an ideology and it's not about material needs. Um, I think we've gotten good at understanding what that means. It's about sustainability. And um, I don't think we've gotten there. Um, and now I'm having, I'm in moments where I've had, and when I did this, this series, young folks who were, who were coming out of college and moving into positions and moving into organizations where they were there and so excited because they had the opportunity to work in a way that they were passionate about. 
and within a year they're coming they're like I don't know if I'm gonna make it mm. and and the reason why is that they have an understanding they've been raised in movement work they've they, they've been active active on camp like they have all the things what they do not have is a is they do not have a method for being able to make it and, and sustain and re-energize to keep showing up every day <laughs> and so the question was what do we do and then for those of us who are older, we can say, well, you could call me, but we all understand how that is. That requires the ability to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can't get there, how do you, how do you, how, you know, how do you even get, how do you even get enough energy to pick up the phone? And so my thing back was who your folks. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I say that who teaches the teachers is a thing that we have to keep working at. Um, and it has, uh, and it has to be a collective process. Like we've got to have a handful of folks who understand us well enough to not let there be too much time and space um, before folks get worried. And if you have those folks, then that's also the folks that you can continue to ground yourself back into with you can be vulnerable with, you can raise challenges and questions and have them help you reconcile so that you can find the answers. Like you, you need a counsel, you need a counsel. Um, I found that in a way that I did not get from my mentors in the movement. Mm. And that's the only reason why I could keep working without being so burnt out um, that I didn't want to do it anymore. Can I build on what mm -hmm. you said? So it's interesting that you, you know, that you brought forward that, you know, that kind of speed run mm -hmm. right through this work to going like, oh my God, right? Because when I, when you were speaking, um, I'm going like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And then you're like, you know, we need everybody to be doing this same kind of work. And I was like, oh, do we though? And I found myself wanting to challenge you, so I'm actually really glad you brought this up. Because yeah. I was like, you know, maybe, maybe, yeah, like I, you know, I feel the urgency and the necessity of someone who is making art, for people to be making art not just about the movement, but within mm -hmm. an effort to create more justice, mm -hmm. more, a more livable life, right, for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I do not think that we can ask everybody to do everything at every moment that they are involved in this work. It won't, they won't be, because they will not be able to do it for very long. You know how like, sometimes if you're hiring someone, they'll be like, okay, good, fast, or cheap, pick two. I think that if we want good work, work done well, um, and we need it to happen fast because shit's unfolding, it cannot be cheap. We cannot treat it as cheap. And that means that we need to involve more people, not just to build the movement, but also to allow people to tap out, to allow people to rest, to allow people to take turns doing the heavy lifting and the lighter load, to involve people who may have great differences in capacity um, I'm thinking about people I know with various disabilities, which would 
prevent them from doing certain kinds of things, but would allow them to do others. Um, and if there's five of them doing those things, doing their little bit, then that also becomes part of the great flow of what we're trying to do, right? Of trying to make a life that is more livable for more people for a longer time. And that, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, I've been supporting um, some student organizers who are trying to get uh, the university where I teach to divest from uh, Israeli occupation forces um, and weapons companies. And I led a little, at their request, I led a little workshop on asking for help um, and on building networks of community care. And it involved some stuff about letting go of shame, of like needing to ask for help, the shame of needing to ask for help. It involved some stuff, like literally physically putting down, we put down shame like it was like a little animal that was trying to climb up our leg. Um, and then we ate a grape. Um, because if you want an animal to do, to learn, you give it a little treat and you are also the animal. <laughs> um, you know, we kind of mapped out different kinds of care and how organized it has to be. Like there's the like, you know, can I call you tonight after the action to just check in? And there's the like, can you be the person who brings the food, like makes the food order? And there's the like, you know, can you look up numbers of therapists for me? There's that, you know, so there's that. And then there's the like, oh, these are the people who are going to give rides today. And these are the people who are going to make sure that this other thing can happen. It's not right for all of those people to all be the same exact people all the time. And it's not right for six people to be doing all of those things. So in our invitation, right, to bring people together to do this work, how do we kind of adapt that invitation to say like, you know, be the artist, sometimes also be the person who gives rides, sometimes also be the person who like shows up and takes the risks um, and to distribute that work the best we can. So I think that's one, one of my kind of like, you know, so I went from going well, like, No, no, I think it's a very important, interesting point because it's a, it's a shift in mindset um, because organizers are going to organize. And so you have to disrupt the organizing thought process a bit because um, one of the things about pointing out how artistic movements and social movements are the same is that because of what art is, a lot of the things that folks are thinking about in terms of culture or care, art, artists have had to deal with already. And when, when the transaction is art and not the experiences of the artist, then what you're missing is a solution that has already been practiced mm -hmm. and modeled. Mm -hmm. so, part, so there's two parts. One is, is, is not asking for, the, for everyone to do the same, but to have, but it's really to, it, the, the engagement starts earlier, so the artist mm -hmm. is a part of the thought mm -hmm. process around it. Um, and then they, they, and so that's the first thing. But the thing you're, but the thing about um, having not, but not that, and that also, which is why I'm glad you said that, means considering the artist outside of their art, mm -hmm. which also inherently happens when you include them. Um, it's a little bit different, um, and it goes to the point that you're making when you haven't been included in the thought process, but you're invited and invited to not be an artist. Because mm. while, it, while it sounds good, it does cause a point of tension with the artist, or can be, especially when the artist is from particular communities where they're showing up feels historically 
like mm. they're showing up to do labor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> um, so there's an equity thing to kind of consider that you can get by when you just when you just invite them to have the conversation. Um, so it's sort of moving the engagement earlier mm -hmm. so that we have time to hold space for all of this. Um, it's because it's a little trickier if you don't. So I'm glad you raised that challenge because that challenge is very valid and it's it's a reason to think about at what point are we starting mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. engage. Yep. You go, no, go ahead. Well, uh, that's is permeated everything uh, so much that even my partner uh, for the first year had to get used to me <laughs> because there's certain things that I do that make sense to me, but they're informed by the folks that I've and I always say that I was raised and I think my family but I was also raised in community, so there's a different understanding um, that. She just was like, and then, and, and even so much so that she didn't believe it was real. And she's like, you don't really think like that. I'm like, I mean, it's ingrained. Mm. Like, I don't know how to see this any other way at this point. Um, and so, like, my friend, like, I am that person, right? I am that person for my family. I'm that person in my friend group. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So, but part of it was... The, this, this, I was, uh, for better or worse, I was, it was this idea of embodied practice, like these things are intended for us to live by. Um, and for me, that's where it started. Like I can't organize around it or help anyone else if, I, if these things aren't real to me. But also that um, because I also was involved in anti-violence work where that, it, that the world, if the world moves differently and if you're not grounded or really committed to like ingraining this, it's easy to opt out. Um, there are going to be opportunities to opt out, and I didn't. I might, they might have they might have put a little they might have a little fear mongering, but when you know you're twenty something and you're that it's, it's like I don't want to turn into a horrible person. So, um, but like I'm glad you asked the question because it is it permeates everything that I do and undergirds everything that I do um, personally yeah, as well. Thank y'all. Um, well, you wouldn't know it from the fact that uh, I was just up here running my mouth for a long time, but my, this work has made me a better listener immeasurably. Immeasurably. It has taught me what listening can do for people, what making a space of quiet for people to speak and resonance for people to speak into can do. Um, and um, I think that has uh, made being around me a better, an actively positive experience for more people. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's one way. And I know that um, they had to leave, but uh, they did ask us to speak to some wins. And so I will do that briefly. Um, two things. Uh, one is um, one of the people that I fought the liquefied natural gas plant with um, uh, a couple of years later, um, her kid was in the hospital uh, with another asthma attack, and we were able to like just coordinate getting dinner to them while they were in the hospital. That's a win to me. That's a win to me. Um, that um, that same group of people fought off another polluting facility in the port a couple of years after that, just before the pandemic, um, we all crowded into the city planner's office and, uh, you know, said that, you know, they wouldn't let us speak, but they saw that we were there. And uh, a little while later, that company withdrew their application. And I'm always going to wonder if that first fight made someone in the city, the first fight lasted about two and a half years. Uh, so we delayed the opening of the natural gas plant for about two and a half years. And I'm always going to wonder if that first fight made somebody in the city 
go to the people who had submitted the permit, the, scra the garbage company, whatever they were, and say, you know, they're going to make this really hard for you. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And that also, to me, is a win. got books there's books in yeah. that box if you want to buy them Danielle my hero and best friend forever <laughs> truly 30 years now 30 years now um, brought went and got those from her doorstep um, if you want to buy one from me uh, even yet. I know you, you will be the very first <laughs> what can they do for you? Get yours today directly, um, directly from Kate. You have a book. You don't you have a new book of poetry out? I do. You can find it anywhere books are sold, <laughs> or you can ask for them at any of your local bookstores and see if they'll grab a couple for you. But I do. Um, the Tell us the title. Uh, it's a month of Sundays is the latest book of poetry. Um, and so um, it's my sixth. So there's five others out there if you, for you if you love poetry, but. Um, but yes, we just released a couple weeks ago, so it's available and out there in the world. And um, I believe both of you have websites that are your names, mm -hmm. right? So people can easily find you both yep. online. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here. Please um, check out their websites. Grab Kate's book before you leave. And take also, your little paper. And I also, yeah, make sure you take your little paper. And I also want to uh, just announce our couple of things we have coming up this spring that haven't happened yet. We're, there's going to be a reading of the play The Children by Lucy Kirkwood um, at Perfect Lovers on April 27th and 28th. Uh, Theater Book Club does readings um, with minimal staging of, um, with real act, you know, trained actors. And this is an environmental play that has won a lot of awards and um, by a uh, British playwright that uh, they'll be doing a reading of in late April. Uh, tickets are free. You can register on our website. And then also in May, we have coming up the Future of Water, which is a speculative art show that opens on May 11th, will be the opening, and it'll be running through May 28th. It'll be at um, Dermart Guild's Golden Bell Gallery. Hmm. And that'll be featuring three artists, Lucas Brown, Patricia Ferreira, and um, James Coyle. Um, that's going to be amazing. Come out and see that. Um, and yeah, have a fantastic rest of your Saturday. Um, eat more snacks on your way out so we don't have to take them home. Get Kate's book, look up both of these guys' websites and follow what they're doing, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Rose. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs>